Dear semantic community members, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to track one on the SEMIC 2021 conference. It's my great pleasure to be with you today. My name is Carmen Karen Pippan and I will lead this track with title showcasing the role of interoperability in public services. We have three different topics which will be presented in the first part by our distinguished speakers. After these presentations, there will be a short questions and answer session where we will be using Slido. Please type your questions and comments in Slido tool using the hashtag SAMIC2021. You can see it on the screen. Please make sure that you select the relevant parallel track on the right hand side of your screen. And of course, don't hesitate to share your thoughts on Twitter or LinkedIn as well using the hashtag SAMIC2021. Let me now begin with our distinguished guest speakers. Our first dual presentation is titled The Slovenian Once Only Platform for Data Exchange and the Trace Solution. It will be presented by my Slovenian colleagues, Ms. Bernarda Kuzel, Project Manager, and Mr. Bustian Tvordik, Head of the Department for Common Building Blocks, both from Directorate for Information Technology, Ministry of Public Administration, Slovenia. Bustian Bernarda, the floor is yours. Please begin with your presentation. Thank you, Carmen. Could we start the presentation, please, from studio? Okay. Uh, could we see the next slide, please? Hello, good morning. My name is Bustian Tvornik. I come from Ministry of Public Administration of Slovenia, and together with Mrs. Bernarda Kozel, my colleague, we will try to give you a brief insight into the Slovenian once-only platform for data exchange and the trace solution as its core element. Next slide, please. Let's start with once-only principle. You will have a general idea what once-only principle is. We can say that it is a principle of designing uh, public services uh, where users have to submit uh, their data to authorities only once. Only once is experienced by users through digital services, but it has to be provided by backend systems. Next slide, please. So we built a data exchange system that connects data providers on one side and data consumers on the other. Data providers are those who own data sources, and data consumers are typically digital service providers, such as portals and backend systems. Did we build our platform from scratch? No, actually not. We just took uh, the results of a large IT project, which transformed uh, that project into a platform based on ecosystem of horizontal building blocks. Next slide, please. Okay, the demands of that project back in 2010 of Ministry of Social Affairs, uh, its intention was to gather data, all relevant data on st uh, social status of an individual uh, to prevent uh, fraud and uh, to enable as fair as possible social transfers. Uh, main demand was to gather, to gather data from uh, more than 50 data sources. Next slide, please. This is an illustration of it. Uh, besides the distribution of data sources that was very large, uh, the various data distribution mechanisms uh, put uh, an obstacle in front of us. Uh, you can see that on the right side of the screen. Next slide, slide please. Uh, to overcome these challenges, uh, we built three different functionalities at our ministry. These are the central system for data exchange, uh, data storage and distribution system, and system for, uh, for asynchronous data exchange. These functionalities were general enough to become modules and then later common building blocks. Next slide, please. Let's uh, take a brief look at them. Interoperability module is a module that connects to a data source without distribution mechanisms. 
makes a replication of it and offers distribution of uh, its data through web service. Next slide, please. Asynchronous module is a module that provides a waiting room uh, to data sources uh, that uh, could not respond in real time. And they have an option to upload their data and again, to uh, distribute them via web service. Next slide, please. By applying uh, those two modules to so-called problematic data sources, uh, we can put to work our third building block. This is the tray. Uh, and the tray connects to uh, standardized uh, data sources by those two building blocks and provides the data to data consumers. Next slide, please. Uh, we call it the tray because from the data consumer's perspective, uh, the tray acts like a big data source that incorporates all other data sources. So from data consumer's perspective, it's just one data source, but virtually, of course. Uh, since the tray is uh, the core of our uh, platform, uh, it's time, I think, to look at it a bit more in details. So please, uh, next slide, and Bernarda, please, the stage is yours. Thank you, Bustian. I am Bernarda Kuzil, and this picture presents a national once-only platform. Part of it is the tray. The tray is the central data exchange system. It's a kind of marketplace for data clients and data sources. It's connected to it the most important registers population, business tax, land register, and so on. Next slide, please. Preparing a data client and data source in a tray is very easy. It's done through the administrative module. Once you have a data client and data source administrated, we can seamlessly connect them. We promote designing of generic web services that are reusable. Next slide, please. How is data exchange via tray? The citizen, for example, the student logs into the portal with the certificate, identifies, and the portal forward the student to his or her profile. The student then selects the desired service on the portal. It then sends the user's ID and the procedure's ID to the tray. Then procedure's ID specifies which set of data is requested. Based on this data, the tray generates requests for individual sources that the service requires. The tray encrypts the obtained answers with public key of the portal and returns the data to the portal. The portal shows the received data to the student or fill out the forms. The student then decides whether to forward the data or stop the service. The tray ensures that data is always retrieved from the primary data source. The user does not need to enter it. The data set returned by the source is minimal due to, due to data protection, and the same sort of data is always obtained from the same data sources. Users of the tray is always data client system. Natural person never use the building block directly. Next slide, please. In 2019, we exp experienced an unfavorable situation. For the need of automatic calculation of entitlement to social assistance, 200,000 requirements were sent to the tray in a very short time, like a tsunami, which means 900,000 requests for data sources. In such a case, there are no there is a high prob probability that the system will crash. Therefore, we made a tray machine learning. The solution has been learning from the past data. It uses the incremental learning method and uses the data to predict the responsiveness of data sources. Next slide, please. And how did we do that? For the first four months, we collected data on the responsiveness of data sources. After four months, we did an I, an analysis and determinate the features. 
Based on this, we used an algorithm and we were able to calculate the current availability of data sources and predict the availability for the future. Next slide, please. The tray uses prediction to throttle requests to the sources and put the weight request in the queue. The advantages of this system is that it learns incrementally, which gives it greater exactness as it involves prediction in a very, sh very short time with a large number of influencing factors. Machine learning supports efficient and smart data exchange. And last but not least, we got a new reusable building block. Next slide, please. Thank you, Bustian. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, so we've got uh, ourselves uh, a platform, once only platform data exchange. Uh, what are the applications of this platform? Uh, it is used in implementing public digital services on portals for citizens and businesses. In fact, services, uh, portal, ser services portal, uh, especially for insight into users on personal data and for pre-filling application forms, but also for back office data exchange, so to provide the data to back office. Uh, all the building blocks are managed by Ministry of Public Administration. Their uh, production- Dan, it's free. your last minute, please. Okay, thank you. I will finish in a minute. Uh, they are free of charge to all public administrations. And next slide, please. They are ready to use uh, individually, what you can see in the center, individually or the platform as a whole. This is just a big picture of the system, just in order to show you. Next slide, please. In order to show you how we incorporated the, uh, the platform in a cross-border system, uh, which was applied for piloting in top project and where we have learned some lessons. And one of the lessons is that uh, semantic interoperability, which was not a dramatic issue on the national level, is uh, quite a challenge uh, in cross-border interoperability. Uh, so the further we reach, the higher levels of interoperability we have to engage and are more and more important. Next slide, please. And not only in top, we use, we're using it also in the project uh, Digital Europe for All, and we definitely uh, are going to put it to work uh, for a subsystem of once only technical system in similar digital gateway. And the last slide, please, which we will only use to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much both for your excellent presentation. We move now to second presentation, which is titled Application Programming Interface, API Principles and Guidelines for the Finnish Public Administration. The speaker is Mina Arayevi, Senior Specialist from Ministry of Finance, Finland. Mina, the stage is yours. Please begin with your presentation. Thank you, Carmen. And good morning or good afternoon to all. Uh, it's very nice and uh, I'm ha very happy to participate for this event and uh, tell you about the API principles and guidelines for the Finnish public administration. Uh, I could take the next slide, please. Now I cannot really see the slide very well, but uh, perhaps. Um, from my other screen also, yeah. Well, we could go further actually for the third slide, please. Yes, a little bit about the background. So I work in the Ministry of Finance in this uh, project called Opening Up and Using Public Data. And it was uh, set by the Ministry of Finance in spring 2020. And the project will implement the objective uh, of the governance program by promoting wider and more effective use of public data across society. And this uh, project will last until the end of uh, next year. Uh, and this project aims, among other things, to promote the coherent use of data and functions, uh, primarily through APIs. 
and the project involves preparing and implementing the national API principles and guidelines. And these principles will also be used uh, in the national implementation of the European Commission's recommendations on API framework for digital government. So uh, we are formed the principles based on the recommendations and also based on the needs of uh, public administration stakeholders. Uh, next slide, please. So why we are doing this? Uh, at the moment, uh, there are no common principles or uh, frame for, for API development in the public sector in Finland. We do have a lot of APIs, uh, but the API development is carried out in individual organizations. and There is a lack of interoperability, for example. And the benefits of APIs are not identified or understood at different levels of organizations. We do have uh, bigger organization and municipalities and agencies that are very uh, far in API development. They have competence, they have capabilities, they have resources to develop APIs. But then we have also these uh, smaller organizations where is a room for improvement in competence and capabilities. Uh, next slide, please. So the main goal is to, uh, to create a shared, shared set of principles and this framework for API development in Finland public administration. And uh, it is also important to promote a customer driven approach and cooperation, reusability, interoperability, information security and data protection, as well as quality in API development. And these common principles will promote functionality and harmonize uh, use of information primarily through APIs. Uh, and the principles are intended for use by the entire public administration for purposes such as public information system produce, uh, producement and interface development. But the principles will be available for everyone, so that's also uh, private sector can use these principles when they want to uh, develop APIs. And next slide, please. Uh, the principles are divided to three different levels, uh, strategic, tactical and operational. Uh, strategic level principles provide guidance for the organization management for setting the direction and goals for API development. So it is uh, informant, important than uh, in management level, uh, it's the APIs are understood and uh, the APIs are a part of uh, organization uh, business process and the data management. The tactical level principles provide guidance for the overall management of APIs and for the further development. And operational level principles provide guidance for the development and ma maintenance of individual APIs. And it is important that these levels uh, talk to each other and cooperate. Next slide, please. And here you can see the principles. Uh, I do not uh, present the principles in detail because we do not have time for that. Uh, but the document in which uh, the principles are listed uh, uh, includes also description of the principles and examples and um, support material for the stakeholders to uh, uh, introduction these principles. And next slide, please. And here you can see the process that we have had. Uh, we started this um, work last year, and we have had a lot of uh, stakeholder events. We have had a lot of comment rounds, and they have all all been open for everyone. So, so everyone uh, have had chance to to uh, comment these principles and contribute for these principles. And we have also had. Um, events for, for private sector actors and 
at the moment, these principles are finished and uh, we are translating them uh, into Swedish and English. And these will be published uh, early in next year. Uh, next slide, please. So what will happen next year? Uh, we have to ensure the maintenance and further development of the API principles and also support uh, cooper cooperation across networks. So the Finnish uh, digital agency will coordinate this network uh, cooperation next year. And then we will also uh, prepare this virtual training about uh, interoperability and APIs, and uh, it will be free of charge and available for anyone. Thank you. Nina, thank you very much for your splendid presentation. Now we move to our last dual presentation, which is titled Evolution of Data Catalog Application Profile, DKTAP, to enhance the reuse of interoperability of data across public administrations. It will be presented by Ms. Sigrid Sitt, Director of Data Policy, Ministry of Economic Affairs and Communications, and Mr. Max Deckers, Independent Informational Professional and Metadata Expert, both from Estonia. Sigrid and Max, the floor is yours. Please start with your presentations. Yes, hi. Um, I think I'll also start with the most popular sentence. Next slide, because I don't see the... Oh, okay, it was still the last slide. Can you go back? Sorry. Thank you. Yeah, uh, so good day from Tallinn. Uh, I'm really glad to have been invited here today. Uh, as said, my name is Sigrid, and I've been asked to speak about why we decided to implement the ticket AP standard in our national open data portal. So now next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, thanks to Boston and Bernarda, uh, we already heard about the once only principle today. And in Estonia, we also believe in storing personal data in one place, i.e. in one registry, and requesting for it uh, if necessary, because it is easier to keep it timely and correct this way, and uh, very likely also safer. Uh, for this fun personal data sharing, we have had the X-Road since 2001. X-Road is a data exchange layer enabling a secure internet-based data exchange between information systems. And so here you can see uh, some facts and numbers about the success that uh, X-Road has in terms of popularity. Millions of requests just in one month and hundreds of uh, institutions, um, sorry, not in one month, um, to set the scene Estonia is a relatively small country of 1.3 million people, so numbers in millions and hundreds are huge. So next slide, please. Um, the X-Road enables data sharing between not only public sector agencies, but by now almost one third of all members are uh, from the private sector. For example, data exchanges here are shown between bailiffs and the transportation agency, tax agency, and so on. And so data shared there is personal and does not include open data. But I find it was important to show that since 2001, a lot of data, data has uh, been shared very successfully. So next slide, please. Uh, and that's all really great, but agencies had their needs met with regards to data sharing and didn't really see the need to publish any of their data. This is evident from this uh, timeline. Public sector agencies use the x road but they should also publish the majority of their data because Estonia, whatever can be published, should be published. And in 2014, uh, open data was in theory made more of a priority and next to some legislative changes, the green book 
of the open data was published, meaning a strategic uh, vision. And so it was soon followed by our old open data portal uh, that was super lightweight and based on chicken. Metadata was asked uh, about a data Meta, uh, metadata that was asked was minimal. Uh, it was, I guess, if I remember correctly, title, license, and uh, very few other things. And uh, it did not give too much information about a data, data set. Uh, so next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, our new portal is now here. Uh, its source code is available for reuse, and it's now got many more functionalities compared to the compared to the, its predecessor. It's ticket AP 2.01 compliant, and that was a set requirement from our side from day one. For us, it was really important that we could send our data sets to the European data portal, and for that, we needed to comply with the standard especially created for European data portals. Uh, interoperability is important for us because now a title in Estonian can still be interpreted as a title thanks to the title element. Uh, and so another really important thing for us uh, in Estonia here uh, was to find the balance when it comes to not burdening the data publishers too much with excessive amounts of metadata that they should publish. But also we wanted to collect enough metadata that the data reusers need to make sense of the data sets. And so DCAT AP provided us with a pan-European standard that has been used by many before us and developed by its own team. So it really was a win-win situation for us. The question was, uh, Quite simple, actually. Why would we make up our own standard from scratch and have it not be interoperable with other European data portals and think what elements are important to gather as metadata? So thanks to the new development project, we had the chance to build a new portal and build it in compliance with international standards. And so it is a standard that helped us launch our open data portal and open data related goals. And not to be one of the last countries in the EDP index, for example. But I will now leave the floor to Max. So, you go. I guess next. Okay. Time. Thank you, Sigrid, uh, for your uh, presentation of the use of DCAT AP in Estonia. Uh, I am Max Deckers. I am a member of the CEMIC team that develops and maintains the uh, DCAT AP standard. And I'd like to talk to you about a couple of minutes about what we do uh, at the CEMIC uh, activity part of Interoperable Europe uh, in terms of uh, what we have done and also uh, what we're uh, thinking of doing in the next period. So, next slide, please. Uh, just to say that DCAT AP, from our point of view, is a specification for the metadata, that is the description of data sets. Uh, and then you can think about uh, statistical data, environmental data, budget data, but also the accident data that uh, uh, Sigrid talked about. Uh, and to say that DCAT AP is based on an international standard, uh, which is called uh, DCAT and is developed by the World Web Consortium. So it's a global standard that can be used uh, around uh, the world. Uh, we have uh, in DCAT AP adapted the use of that standard for European use, and we call it an application profile. So it's used for a particular application. And the objective of that application profile is to provide a common approach across Europe to achieve interoperability. Oh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, Interoperability uh, for us is about common understanding. So what DCAT AP does in the specification, it provides a minimum set of common descriptors. So that allows exchange and aggregation of information. Uh, at the same time, allowing national and regional extensions 
to satisfy additional requirements, uh, but in such a way that it preserves the interoperability across borders. Now, this is currently done by many countries uh, and also domain specific communities. So they uh, add uh, specific requirements to them. Uh, there is, for example, an extension that is for geographic information. There's an extension for statistical information, and there are various uh, national standards uh, that are being used. And those standards, those profiles uh, that are all compatible with the general DCAT AP profile uh, are used uh, in harvesting by the European Data Portal, which is currently called data.europa.eu. Uh, and that creates a common a view of the data that is available around Europe. Next slide, please. Now, the specification does not only have a list of common descriptors, so for example, the title or the license that uh, Sigrid was talking about, or the URL where the file is, but we also have a list of what we call uh, common code lists or vocabularies. Uh, an example of what you see here on the slide is the classification of data sets according to the area of interest uh, or the subject or the team, if you will, we call those the 13 data set teams, uh, which was a list that was developed by the stakeholders together to be able to classify data sets in a common way across Europe. Uh, countries can either use that list or just uh, convert their data or map their data to the list when they contribute their data to the European data portal. And you can see, for example, you can uh, have a facet of uh, health or energy or, or education where you can uh, have that possibility on a portal to actually have a facet that you can look at uh, uh, in, uh, that is of interest to you. So that is what we've done. Uh, and I can say that there are many countries and many domains that are currently using it. Uh, and I'd like to say a couple of words about the future directions of the Get AP. Next slide, please. And then the next slide. Uh, we want in the work that we're doing uh, on DCAT AP, uh, first of all, continue to focus primarily on cross-border and cross-domain use cases, because we feel... Max, it's that, your last minute, please. Yes, that's okay. Uh, that's for those cross-border and cross-domain use cases, and then bring together the stakeholders in the EU member states to respond to their needs. Uh, and uh, that the idea for that is that we do that. Uh, we have a large amount of data, but there is also a need for guidelines, because the implementers have the need to create common interpretation of some parts of the standard. So we're going to do that as well. Uh, the third thing is that we're going to investigate how DCAT AP can be used across more domains, because we have a couple of domains uh, involved, but we think that it's uh, going to be very useful also for other domains, for example, in health, in tourism, in research, for example. Uh, then we want to promote DCAT AP as a common standard across what you've heard already also saying uh, in the presentation of uh, uh, earlier, uh, the European data spaces. Uh, those data spaces are domain oriented, but we see that DCAT AP has a real role to play to connect those different communities. So what we feel is that by connect connecting more and more communities and making more and more metadata interoperable, we can expand the amount of data that can be found and reused. In the end, we feel that everybody wins and we hope to continue to contribute to that. Thank you very much. Sigrid and Max, thank you both for your great presentation too. I believe we all got some new knowledge about technical details, good practices and policies and also some strategic view in the future development in the field of semantic interoperability. Now we will begin with questions and answers part. We do not have much time left. I will jump now to the slide of questions from audience to see what we have. I can see we got some questions. I will 
begin this uh, first question, I think it's for Bustian. Bustian, is all the data from all data sources stored on the tray? Please. Okay, thank you. I unmuted myself, so. <laughs> uh, no, no, not all the data is stored on the tray. It seems like all the data is stored on the tray. It's only virtual view. Uh, actually, almost no data is stored on the tray because the tray is not storage oriented system. It's more like a transactional system. It uh, gets the request from data consumers, uh, proceed them to data providers, and then uh, proceed answers back. And uh, the data resides on the tray uh, exclusively uh, the time until the data consumer takes them. And even uh, during that time, the data is encrypted and the train never sees the payload uh, that it carries around. I hope I answered the question. Thank you very much, Bustian. I think you did. I will jump now for, to the question for Mina. What kind of feedback have stakeholders provided on the principles and how has been the feedback taken into account? Please, Nina. Yes, that's a very, very good question. Uh, mainly the stakeholders uh, think that these principles uh, are possible to introduce and uh, uh, the feedback has all also been uh, very positive that uh, uh, stakeholders uh, think that it's a good idea to have this um, uh, three levels, this uh, strategic, tactical and operational. They think that uh, makes those principles more clear and logic. And uh, yes, we have uh, all the time that we have been uh, uh, preparation this this um, principles, we have uh, here the feedback that we have got from the stakeholders and the contributions. So yes, we have take into account every comment that we have got. Thank you very much, Mina. And uh, last question from audience for Sigrid and Max. I think it's more for Max. How does the European Commission involve stakeholders like data providers and users in the work of DKTP. Please, Max. Yeah, so that's a good question. Uh, I think that's also one of our main objectives uh, in the work that we do on DKTP, to involve as many as possible of the implementers and the users uh, uh, of DKTP. And therefore, there is a, a working group uh, on DKTP where uh, all interested parties uh, are invited uh, to participate. Uh, we have a GitHub repository where people can uh, raise issues and where discussion can take place. And then we publish information uh, both on GitHub and on JoinUp. And uh, in that sense, uh, everybody is welcome to contribute. And we do our best to indeed uh, take into account all the comments that people have. And that is something that has operated for the last eight years. And I think our stakeholders are mostly very happy with the way that we work on that. So if there are people here listening who are interested in seeing how the technical development of DCAT AP goes, then you can have a look at join up when there is uh, when those things are uh, published. And you can also find links to the GitHub re repository where you can uh, contribute if you want. Thank you. Thank you, Max. I think we got another question. I think it's also for you or, or Sigrid. Do you use an Estonian DCAT profile on top of the EU DCAT profile? Do you think a national profile is useful? I guess that's more for me. Um, we use the DCAT AP, but I guess you can say it's DCAT AP EE. Uh, it's basically the same, but we have been uh, because we want to have more uh, metadata available. Uh, for example, uh, distributions license for us is mandatory, so we have just played with mandatory, uh, making more fields mandatory, but otherwise it's, it's the same. 
Thank you. It seems this DKTP seems to be uh, interesting topics because we have another question here. And it says where to find the developed common lists for teams countries. An exact reuse is key for full interoperability. Can I ask answer that? Uh, yes, all please the, do, Max. All the controlled vocabulary, so including the data set themes and the countries, are uh, hosted and maintained by the publications office of the EU. And there is a website which is called EU Vocabularies, where you can find, I think, uh, uh, something like 100 different uh, code lists that can be used. And DCAT AP uses as much as possible the code lists that are maintained by the Publications Office of the EU. So if you want to go and have a look there, search for EU vocabularies and you can find all those lists that are being used. Thank you very much to all of you for your answers. Now I would have a question for you all, for all three topics. What in your regard was most challenging part in implementing your solution, your project? What experiences would you like to share with us? Maybe Bustian and Bernarda, would you answer first? Would you? I, I think I think the biggest challenges, of course, were in uh, 2011 when the system was uh, uh, being set up. At, the, uh, at that time, this was a great technical and even greater organizational challenge. Uh, but at the moment, I st we still have some work to do with the semantics for new data sources. And the legal and organi organizational part of interoperability remains the biggest challenges in the future, especially in designing cross-border digital services. I think this is the biggest challenges. I agree. <laughs> Thank you, Bernarda and Ustian. Mina, what would you like to share with us? Well, I think that perhaps the easiest part is over when we have finished those principles and the hard part is, is starting next year when we are implementing and supporting the introduction, uh, introduction of, of API principles. So I think that we will have a lot of challenges uh, next year but uh, yeah, I think the, the biggest work is, is uh, coming up next year. We are uh, implementing these, these principles. Thank you, Mina. And uh, last but not least, Sigrid and Max, please also for your experiences, what would you like to share with us? Sigrid, you go first. I will go first, uh, thanks. Um, I guess it's mainly still been very positive. Uh, for example, data publishers have not complained that we have started to gather a lot more metadata than before, but maybe one of the um, difficulties we have faced is just mapping between different standards. Uh, for example, we use the Ticket AP, but the land board uses everything Inspire. So just mapping between different, uh, different uh, values and, and stuff like that has really um, has been um, a thing for us. Yeah, and the the, the, the challenges that we had are, are sort of the same uh, uh, in the same area. When you are trying to create agreements uh, with a lot of people, you will have people who have completely different views of the world. And uh, one of the things that was a challenge over the years in uh, the DCAT AP working group was trying to get people to understand each other uh, and finding sort of common ground between them. Uh, there is also the, uh, the issue that when you're trying to do an agreement, when you try to apply a standard, then everybody has to change a little bit uh, because in a, in a way people would want to do the, their own thing and they know how to do their own thing. They know what their requirements are. And then using a standard means that you can't always get everything that you want. So I think we have been quite successful. We're still having very uh, heated discussions about certain things in the uh, DCAT AP working group. But I think that's a, that it's a challenge, but it's also uh, something that is really interesting to do 
and very rewarding if then at the end you agree with people to have a common view. Thank you. Thank you very much also to Sigrid and Max. And now it's time to slowly conclude our session. It was really a pleasure for me to be with you today. Speakers, thank you all for your brilliant presentations. Participants, thank you for your time. I hope you all enjoyed our session. We will now have a lunch break until 2 p.m. I wish you an excellent day. See you in the plenary session for the Interoperability Academy Speaking Corner. Thank you and goodbye.